ever really know what you're going to get, but that's what makes it all the more beautiful. Punk CEO Jim Swatt built a £2 billion business, then controversy struck. Can the captain steer the good ship through the storm? Listen to the full story on BBC Sounds. Here next, live head-to-head -head debate in Stoke-on-Trent between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, our next Prime Minister on BBC One Scotland. in the hunt for league and cup glory. No chance returns. And the party can start. Our weekend of coverage starts Saturday from 11.30 across the BBC. Now in a change to some listings for BBC One Scotland, the two remaining Conservative leadership contenders go head to head. Who will be our next Prime Minister, Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak? In just six weeks' time, one of them will be moving into number 10 Downing Street. Welcome to the first head-to-head -head debate between the two final candidates in this race to become the Conservative Party leader and our next Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak is the MP for Richmond in Yorkshire. He is 42 years old. He was in government from 2018 until he resigned as Chancellor just three weeks ago. Liz Truss is the MP for South West Norfolk. She is 47 tomorrow. It's her birthday. She has served in government since 2012 and is the Foreign Secretary. These are the final two candidates chosen by Conservative MPs. But now it's down to Conservative Party members, around 160,000 or so. We don't know the exact number, they don't tell us. But they are the ones who will choose the next occupant of number 10. It is a huge decision. Hardly any of us has a say. But that decision will affect us all. And that is why we've come here to Stoke-on-Trent in the West Midlands tonight. For decades, a Labour stronghold, one of those so-called red wall seats that turned blue, voting for the Conservatives under Boris Johnson at the last general election. Our audience here at Victoria Hall all voted for the Conservatives in 2019, some of them for the very first time. Will they do so again under a new leader? With me tonight as well, two of the BBC's experts, our political editor, Chris Mason, and our economics editor, Faisal Islam. They will be listening to the debate and probing the candidates' answers. Welcome as well to listeners on Radio 5 Live, also to people watching on iPlayer. You can join the debate online using the hashtag BBC, our next PM. Now, before we go any further, Chris, Faisal, what will you be looking for tonight? The key thing for me tonight, Sophie, is to what extent can our two wannabe Prime Ministers woo our audience here in the room in Stoke-on-Trent and Conservative voters from the last general election? Boris Johnson was able to woo them. Can Rishi Sunak and can Liz Truss? And at a moment where we think that energy bills might go up to, say, £3,200 for an average household in the autumn, I'll be looking for clues as to whether a new Prime Minister will lead to a change in economic policy and whether those plans add up. So, Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, good evening. Welcome to both of you. Are you ready for this? 
Yes, I am. Yep, absolutely. So. Now, only one of you can be the next Prime Minister, and tonight we want to hear both of you debating the big issues with each other as you try to convince people why you will make the best leader of the United Kingdom. Now, we're going to start tonight with the issue that many of our audience say worries them the most, the cost of living, energy bills, fuel prices, food prices. So let's hear from some of them. Uh, Giles, you're a police officer. How are you finding all these rising prices? Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, just in the last six months alone, my home energy bills have tripled, mm. uh, and it's a concern. Charlotte, in the audience as well? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to say that I can see that the government have basically contributed towards universal credit and people on benefits, but I'm a single parent and I work full time and I travel mm. and I'm struggling. OK, the views of two of our audience here tonight. Um, I want you both to be really specific here. If you are Prime Minister in September, can people expect you to give them more help with their bills, with their rising costs? Rishi Sunak. So if you just before we start, could I just take a moment to pay tribute to David Trimble, who we just learned passed away before we came on air. He was a giant of unionism. He helped bring peace to Northern Ireland as an architect of the Good Friday Agreement. And he was a deserved winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And I'm sure everyone's thoughts will be with his family tonight. Now, Giles, at Charlotte, I know it's difficult. And part of the last few months as Chancellor, I spent all my time talking to people like you across the country, figuring out how we can help meet some of those rising bills. You may remember one of the last things I did as Chancellor was announce significant amount of support to help people get through the autumn and the winter with those bills. And of course, as Prime Minister, I'd like to make sure that we always have the policies in place to support people like you who are working incredibly hard to provide for you and your families, and especially, Charlotte, uh, for your child who you're parenting alone. That is difficult, and I appreciate that. Will there now, be any more help, though? So I've, when we get in, we'll have to see what happens to energy bills. I think people have seen from me over the past couple of years that as a situation changes on the ground, I'm always going to respond to support people through it. But that's just about the short term. I think it's also worth us taking a moment to think, well, how do we solve this problem in the long term? And I think there's a couple of things we can do. The first is to help people with energy efficiency. Now, there's lots of you here and watching whose homes I think we can better insulate. We know that there are millions of homes that need better insulation. If we help do that, we can help people save £300 off their energy bills. So that's something I like Absolutely. to do more and, the, and we need nice... more homegrown energy here at home, because if we have more affordable sources of and British energy in the long term, that's how we're going to solve And as I said, problem. though, at the beginning, I want short-term specifics. So can I gauge from that that there won't be anything in the immediate future, not September, not October, to help people with bills? Just no, yes no. Of, of course there could be. And we'll have to see what the price cap actually is when we get there. As we heard, we don't know quite where it's going to be. I announced support earlier this year, which provides around £1,200 of total support for the most vulnerable, but help for everybody. But it's a case of but wait and see. Okay, we'll I, need to, to... I, mean, I think we've got, had this problem where we know energy bills are very volatile. And we need to actually now see what they're going to end up at. Right. And if there's more that needs to be done, of course I would do that, as I've done over the past two years. Liz Truss, if you are Prime Minister, will you be well, doing something immediately to help people with these bills? Well, first of all, I also want to pay tribute to David Trimble, who was a political giant and who secured, helped secure peace in Northern Ireland. I would act immediately. I understand that people here, people around the country, are struggling with some of the worst cost of living problems that we've had for generations. It's hard to pay for fuel. It's hard to pay for food. I would reverse the increase in national insurance. We promised not to raise it in our manifesto in 2019. The people here who voted Conservative for the first time expect us to fulfill our promises. So I'd reverse that increase in national insurance. I'd also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy, which would help cut money from fuel bills. That was very important. That would come in straight away. But I'd also immediately put in place a growth plan to grow our economy. Okay. Because the way we are going to solve our issues as a country, the way we're going to pay back our debt is by growing the economy. And we're that going is to very, come, very important. And we're going we to come to on take, to all that. Absolutely. We need to take advantage of the post-Brexit growth opportunities. And I believe we can do that and we can make real progress. Fine. So you have come straight to the heart of the, the divide between the two of you. When is the right time to cut taxes. Is now the right time to cut taxes, Rishi Sunak? Well, look, we all took a decision to protect the economy and support the NHS through COVID. And of course, we all knew there was a bill that we needed to pay for that. So the question is, should we pay that bill ourselves 
Or do we put it on the country's credit card and pass the tab to our children and grandchildren to take care of? Now, I don't think that's right. I don't think it's responsible, and it's certainly not conservative, and that's what I wouldn't do as Prime Minister. Not responsible, Liz Truss. Under my plans, we would start paying down the debt in three years' time. So I'm not putting it on the never-never. I would start paying it down but, but in Liz, three that, years. Liz, that's uh, simply not right. You promised me. almost excuse £40 me, you, billion you... Pounds of unfunded tax cuts, but... £40 billion pounds more borrowing. That is the, company, the country's credit card. It's our children and grandchildren. Everyone here is that kids. Is, that so is we're going to have true. to pick up the tab for that. Rishi, that and is not true. there's nothing conservative about doing Under that. my plans, we would start paying down the debt in three years' time. COVID was a one in a hundred years event. No other country is putting up taxes at this moment. The OECD has described Rishi's, Rishi's policies as contractionary. What does contractionary mean? It means it will lead to a recession. Now, we know what happens when there's a recession. I grew up in Paisley and Leeds in the 1980s and 1990s. I know what it's like when people have to struggle, when you have high unemployment, when people don't have work to go to. We cannot allow that to happen. Under my plans, we will... Well, let me, let me, let me, let's just, let's just take on this, right? So we, we remember the 80s and the 90s. And you know what the problem we had then? It was inflation. And it's a problem that we have now. It is the single biggest thing that all of you are having to grapple with at home with your bills. And we need to get a grip of inflation. And if we don't do that now, it's going to cost all of you and everybody watching at home far more in the long run. And you know what? Liz, your plans, your own economic advisor has said that that would lead to mortgage rates, interest rates going up to 7%. Can you imagine what that's going to do for everyone here and everyone watching? That's thousands of pounds on their mortgage bill. It's going to tip millions of people into misery and it's going to mean we absolutely Rishi, have no chance of winning the next election either. Rishi is talking about putting up corporation tax this autumn. He is talking about raising taxes at a time when there is a global economic crisis to the same Liz, level as Liz, France's your corporation own economic tax. Advisor, let's just say, he, your own economic advisor he, has said that your, yeah, your plans would mean that interest rates would have to go up to around 7%. So just think what that means for all of your mortgages. Everyone you watching. That? Right, can you, let, can you let me respond? That would be thousands of pounds. Why please, do you want to cause let me misery respond. to Absolutely. Let, let, let's You are talking about putting up taxes. We know there are companies here in Stoke-on-Trent like Steelite that depend on international investors. We know that they need the investment to help create jobs and opportunities in this city. We know that those jobs are needed for the future and to give people opportunities. I don't believe this negative, declinist language It's your own economic hearing. advisor, Liz. It's we, not mine. We, it's your own advisor. I have lots of economists that are backing my plans. Everybody and, and, thinks and he's the that one putting that up... Cited. Everybody thinks that putting up taxes at this moment is going to hurt the economy. You can't put up taxes and get growth. Can, if we follow Rishi's plans, we, we are we, headed Sophie, for a recession. can we recession. really get an answer to this and question? And your own, right? so Liz, your when, own when you Bank on, of England... When you were on the radio the other day, when you were on the Today programme, you were asked if you could name a single economist, governor, chancellor who supported your plan. The one person you named then gave an interview... This is the person that you named, not me, not my words, his words, and he said that in order for that plan to happen, interest rates would have to go up. He actually described it as a good thing. He said it was part of the adjustment that would have to happen. 7%, that's the number that he gave. I, I, do you know what that would do for people's mortgages? Do you accept I, that? I, I absolutely... That. This is the problem with your plan. It's going to push people into... into let, please let Liz Truss answer. Misery. Please let her answer. When uh, inflation gets uh, out of control, Sunak, please, interest rates go up, Rishi that's Sunak, what Please let Liz Truss answer. I don't accept those points. Any economist knows that taxes are completely different from interest rates. Interest rates are set by the Independent Bank of England. We know that inflation is forecast to fall next year. What I'm talking about with my plans is not raising taxes. There is no evidence at all that not raising taxes is inflationary. What we know, though, is that raising taxes prevents growth. I want to be on the side of people who do the right thing, people who invest in companies, people who go out to work every day, the self-employed, the people running small businesses. That is the people I'm on the side of. And the fact is... I think we still haven't got an answer to this question. Minute, right. this, this, so if we could just minute, get an answer to this question. Minute. This Chancellor has raised taxes to the highest rate 
for 70 years. Right. And I'm... we're now predicted a recession. OK, I now the want to bring in, in the figures. I want to bring in our experts. We have our economics editor here, Faisal Islam. We have our political editor here, Chris Mason, as well. Uh, it, it is the big divide, this issue of tax, Faisal. Question for both. Uh, for Rishi Sunak, uh, can you name a single G7 country that's raising taxes in the current situation? What I can ensure is that our borrowing and debt is falling, and our borrowing and debt is falling like other G7 countries, because we have decided to put a lot of money into the NHS, Faisal, because it's everyone here's number one public service priority. And unlike other G7 countries, we fund our NHS through taxation. And if we want to get the backlogs down, if we want to support all the NHS workers, I'm sure, in the audience tonight, I thought it was the right and responsible thing to do to get the funding into the NHS. So that's what I did, what I did. But because I also think it's not moral. It's not moral to ask our children to pick up the tab for the bills that we're not prepared to pay. It's not a conservative thing to do because if we're not for sound money, what is the point in the Conservative Party? It's the most conservative of conservative values. Can and that's what I stand for. Can I answer Faisal's question? The answer is that countries like the US, Canada and Japan all have higher levels of debt than the UK but they are not following the policies that will lead to a recession. We are an outlier. Everybody understands that COVID is a one in a hundred year event oh. and trying to pay it back straight away so quickly that we actually damage our economy, that we end up causing a recession, that we end up in people being out of work and that hardworking taxpayers who do the right thing have seen their taxes rise despite the fact that we promised in our manifesto so, Liz, not well, well, I, sorry, to sorry, do hang it. On, I think I, that is what is Liz, wrong. You, just mentioned, you just mentioned three countries. Do you know what mortgage rates are in the US at the moment? Do you want to use them as an example? Their mortgage rates are almost 50% higher than mortgage rates in this country because they're borrowing so much. I'm, I'm you sorry, this Canada. is scaremongering. Ca Canada actually this is has project a, fear. Liz, I, I, I remember the it referendum is. campaign. I remember the referendum campaign, and there were only one of us who was on the side of Remain and Project Fear, and it was you, not me. Okay. And you talk well, maybe about I've this. Learnt from we, that. We, we, we talk about this. It was your economic advisor, right? You were on the Today programme. You named one person who supported your plans. That one person, not me, not some theoretical thing. That one person said that your plans would mean interest rates going up to seven percent. Let's I, I, I I mean, back you in. be honest with people about the trade-offs involved. I, I would because like your to... proposals would mean that we get the short-term sugar rush of unfunded borrowed tax cuts, but that would be followed by the crash of the higher highest... prices and higher mortgage rates. And that is Rishi, not something that I want to cause. You've just put in the highest here. tax rate for seventy years. How on earth can you claim that that's going to drive economic growth? And where have the growth policies been for the past two and a half years to drive investment into our towns and cities you, you across this country? You know what, Let, what I would do is I would realise the post-Brexit opportunities. I would do things like change solvency to a MIFID and I get on with it because I'm prepared to take on the orthodoxy. The reality here is this is the same line that we heard from Gordon Brown when he was in the Treasury, the same line being repeated. Well, now. hang on. I, I, I must, I must, I must clarify Sorry, one thing. I must clarify really, one thing. Really important. Hang on. I, I, you I talk must... about the same line. Liz, let me just read something to you. Let fiscal responsibility slide and allow the deficit to balloon. We've been there before. It leads to boom and bust. This would lead straight to penury. Not my words, not Gordon Brown's words, your words. And you know what? You were right then and you're wrong now. It's the right conservative logic that? for how to manage the economy. I, I did That's say what that, you said and under my plan, that's their answer. under my plan, Sophie, we would start paying the debt down in three years. That, but what I am not right. advocating is raising taxes at this vital time when we're trying to attract investment into fantastic places like Stoke-on-Trent. It would be a disaster. It makes us internationally uncompetitive. We will see a recession. That's okay. already predicted. I am going to let Faisal is I, I, I must clarify one part of your policy program, Liz Truss, which is you say you're going to stretch the debt out, the COVID debt, which is, I think, about three to four hundred billion pounds over, I don't know, 50 or 100 years. But do you know what long term interest rates are right now? They're higher for longer term debt. So I don't see how this funds any tax cuts. It's going to require tax rises well, let's, because it costs money. Let's be clear, Faisal, there is already headroom of approximately 30 billion in the budget. We are still able to start paying debt down after three years. That, that yeah. is what I am But on proposing. your stretching the COVID debts, I don't understand how it saves any money. I would, obviously, I would obviously make sure, and my chancellor would make sure, that we optimise uh, the way we are taking out those debts. 
the, the point I'm making is I'm illustrating the fact that when you have a major world event, a major economic shock, trying to pay back the debt as quickly as possible is not the right thing to do economically. We didn't do that after the Second World War. We shouldn't do that now. And crashing the economy in order to pay a debt back quicker is a massive mistake. And what I know is that mistake won't just be felt by people living in London, it will be felt by people in towns and cities right across the United Kingdom, and it will be felt here in Stoke-on-Trent. And I don't want people to suffer that. The mistake, I also... The mistake, I, 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 make, I the, the, mistake, to reply that the, the mistake that we will make is at a time when inflation is already high, everyone's already feeling it in their bills, interest rates are already on the rise. So into that situation, does anyone think that the sensible thing to do is go on a massive borrowing spree worth tens of billions of pounds and fuel inflation even not, further? Okay, Christmas, if, we, okay. if we do that, all it's going to mean is inflation Christmas stays here for longer and interest rates are going to go up. Can That's Mason, what your own like, economic um, advisor says. Can, can I just ask Chris Mason to, to interject, first of all, please? Yeah, a question to each of you, uh, examining your, your current record and your plans. Rishi Sunak first, could you ever credibly go into a general election promising tax cuts and, and expect the electorate to believe you, given how often they've gone up when you were Chancellor? Yes, because I was also the Chancellor during Covid. And I think everyone in this audience and everyone watching will recognise that that was a very exceptional event that required an exceptional response. And I think everyone will want to know that we get the backlogs down and we support the NHS to recover strongly, which is why I had to do some difficult things. Were they easy for me? Of course they weren't easy for me. I'm not in this to do the politically convenient thing, the thing that makes my life easier. You can tell that from this leadership campaign. But actually, being Prime Minister about being honest with all of you, explaining the real trade-offs that we have to do, the responsible way to deal with things, making sure that we protect the inheritance for our kids and our grandkids. And even if that's not easy, that's the kind of leadership you'll get from me as Prime Minister. But on tax cuts, I am going to deliver tax cuts, actually. We're going to deliver tax cuts for business investment, because that's how you drive growth and productivity in places like Stoke. Taxes. That's what the businesses here tell me they want. But we're also going to deliver tax cuts in this parliament for working okay. people. An income tax cut for the first time in 16 years years in my plans already paid for because I believe as a conservative that hard work should always pay Chris and that's okay. what I will do and I will go further as well when the time is right. And Liz Truss on your idea of changing the economic orthodoxy you have talked about this for many years in fact you co-wrote a book the best part of 10 years ago that set out some of these arguments. In that book though you and your fellow authors talked about well our audience here in the room tonight and at home watching and listening as Amongst the worst idlers in the world. We work among the lowest hours, we retire early, our productivity is poor. Is that what you're saying to the people who you aspire that, to That's vote not what I'm saying. And, um, I, I in use, a book you wrote. On the, well, it, every author wrote a different chapter. And I wrote the chapter on education. That particular chapter was written by Dominic Raab, who's actually supporting, uh, supporting Rishi's campaign. Uh, so you, but you <laughs> just, 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 to be, just to be absolutely clear, but so what... What Britannia Unchained was about, it was about a belief that Britain could have a better future and that we didn't just need to simply accept the orthodoxy, the way things have always been done, the bean counting of saying, you know, we have to just accept that nothing will ever change. I believe we can do things differently. I want to change our regulations. I want to get those EU regulations off the statute books. That's something that the Treasury you, you has know resisted. What, Liz, you, you talk I about, want to you push. You talk about bean counting. You talk about bean want, counting <laughs> as, it, as if it's, it's somehow not a conservative thing to do to make sure that we pay for the things that we spend money on. You know what? I, my mum was a local chemist. She owned the local chemist in Southampton where I grew up, and I worked in her shop. And actually, I spent my weekends, my evenings, my holidays actually doing her books as well as delivering medicines out to her patients. So I sat there and made sure that it did add up, that she could make payroll at the end of every month to pay for the people who worked for her, that we could run a business that was going to employ people sustainably. That is really important. And actually, I think it's an incredibly conservative thing okay. to believe in. Now, but, I, but, but you, I, talk, you talk about growth. You talk about growth. You talk about growth. Now, look, I, I've spent my career before politics in business, not just here, but around the world. And if you want to drive growth in the 21st century economy, it's about so much more than tax. 
It's about bringing the change we need to make sure that our children are equipped for okay, the digital we're, we're going industries. And no, no, this is important of the future. It's about making sure that we can help people retrain in the middle of their careers. It's about making sure that all the businesses here and elsewhere get the benefit of reformed financial markets to get the cash they need to grow. And we're about I will to bring all of those new is, ideas though, to meet those the, new challenges because of my experience. Me, the, the I am the best person that can lead this country into the future. That's the type of economic right, growth that we need to see. There hasn't been an economic growth plan for the past two and a half years. We haven't done the things like Solvency 2, MIFID, that would have unlocked investment into our country. Can I, can I, I ask, does anyone turbo, put their hands up? I does anyone know what Solvency that. 2 means? I want to turbocharge that. Rishi, it's about enabling investment into towns it, like Stoke-on-Trent. That's what right. it is about. It, it, We're about it, it, to talk about that. And that's what we need, that's what we need to get on with. Okay, I'm, I'm going to somebody. talk about that right now because I need to move on to that because it is something that is very important to people. And mm. by that, I'm talking about levelling up because our audience here tonight, they all voted Conservative in 2019, as I said, some for the very first time. And Boris Johnson told them that levelling up and transforming the lives and opportunities for people across the UK was his defining mission. So let's get the thoughts of some of our audience here tonight on what needs to be done. Uh, Brendan, a warehouse supervisor, uh, joins us now. What are your thoughts? So yeah, my thoughts are, um, we've seen so many services being reduced and um, put back. Um, our local towns um, and cities, um, the town centres are completely empty. There seems to be no investment. We seem to have a rise in antisocial behaviour there. So basically, um, how are they going to level up these sort of areas? What are they going to do for us? OK, so if you become Prime Minister, uh, Rishi Sunak, in the first two years when you are Prime Minister, what changes will people see under you, Prime Minister Sunak, on levelling up? Well, I was just telling the audience before we started, Stoke is a place I've visited more than any other, I think, in the, in the couple of years that I was Chancellor. And, Brendan... It's been a great pleasure to work with your MPs and your council. Abby's a brilliant council leader, and she came to see me early on with an amazing pamphlet about powering up Stoke. Okay, and I was really happy to actually deliver on some of those things. So what your community needed here, which is very similar to what communities across the country need, is regeneration of your town centres. And that's why I was really pleased as Chancellor to make sure that we got you over £50 million. Something like Goods Yard is going to get regenerated to put new offices and residential in there to help bring to life that part of the the town and the city, but also it's about skills. It's about making sure that all the young people here have the skills that they need because today's education, our children's education today is their economy tomorrow. That's what we need to do for you here. And lastly, for your businesses, your advanced ceramic businesses, manufacturing businesses across the country, what they tell me they need is that they want tax cuts on business investment because they want to invest okay. in more equipment, in machinery. To, to that's how we drive trust. productivity. And my plan hear. suggests well, that we will cut and those I also taxes, need to hear and that's from going to be great trust. for the so business. What, what people, Prime Minister Trust, what difference what, will people see? What people want to see is urgent action. They don't want promises tomorrow. They want things today to relieve the cost of living, but also to get spades in the ground in Stoke-on-Trent and other towns and cities across our country. What I would do immediately is put in new low-tax investment zones with simplified planning so we could get on with building and we could get on with those new projects. I'd keep corporation tax low to attract investment from around the world. I know how popular uh, the, you know, the, the products produced here, whether it's the pottery or the toffees from Walker's Toffee, you know, we can turbocharge that. But we need to challenge the orthodoxy that is making things so slow to deliver. And I know people... But that, want, wait, want things to happen urgently. I'm somebody in every job I've done, Absolutely. whether it's the trade deals I've struck at trade, whether what I've done at the Foreign Office, putting the toughest sanctions on Russia of any country, I get things done in government. And I don't just talk, I act. Chris Mason. I want to hear the two of you talking to each other, really, about how important this idea of levelling up is, because it's been so central, hasn't it, to, mm. to Boris Johnson's whole approach to government, written so prominently into the manifesto. And we know when we look at international examples that true levelling up that makes a real difference and people can notice costs billions and billions and billions and a commitment that can last decades. We're seeing 16 newspapers in the north of England tomorrow making the argument that they're desperate to see you two promise that levelling up will continue. Can you say hand on heart it absolutely will be and it will be as central as it has been? Liz Truss. Well, I am completely committed to levelling up. It's not just a slogan for me. It is about the, the life I've had. I've seen you know, what happened in Paisley, what happened in Leeds when children were let down by a combination of low expectations, 
poor opportunities and poor educational standards. So levelling up for me is about changing the Treasury investment rules so they're fair across the country. At the moment, they favour London. It's about making sure that we unleash private sector investment through low tax zones. We need to get on with those. We need to make sure the free ports we deliver are deeper. But it's also about the schools. It's about getting the best schools everywhere in the country and allowing those to thrive as well. So I'm completely committed. And what I want to do is make sure that everybody, regardless of where they live, regardless of where they come from, have the same opportunities across our and country. Could you answer Chris's questions? Yeah, uh, the answer is an unequivocal massive yes, Chris. I'm, I grew up in Southampton, I was saying, and now I represent a, a rural seat in North Yorkshire, uh, where Teesside is my back door. And I've seen the amazing change that I've helped to deliver in a place like that, delivering a free port that's attracted jobs and investment post-Brexit to an area with new industries like carbon capture and storage and vaccine manufacturing. And I think we can bring that same sense of optimism, excitement and opportunity across the country. Because that's what levelling up should mean. It should mean that no matter where you grow up, you have fantastic opportunities to fulfil your potential. But you also have enormous pride in the place that you call home. And that's what Brendan was talking about. Making sure that community that you grow up in is safe for your kids to walk around in in the evenings. Okay. Making sure that the town centres look exciting and clean. That's also part of levelling up. Now, and we need to get both sides right. As, the economic as, side and the pride as side. As Prime Minister, you won't just lead the United Kingdom. You will lead the United Kingdom on a global stage as well. At a time of serious challenges both here at home and abroad. Can we talk about China? Because you've really been trading blows about China today, over Britain's relationship with, Ch with China. Rishi Sunak, you have said that politicians in Britain have rolled out the red carpet and turned a blind eye to China for too long. Are you talking about Liz Truss? No, I mean, look, we've, Liz has been on a journey as well. There was a time when Liz was talking about having a golden era of relationships with China and on a mission there was talking about having deeper collaboration in things like food security and technology. But what we do need to do is acknowledge that China is a threat to our national security. It's a threat to our economic security. And that's why, as Chancellor, I was pleased that we could put forward something called the National Security and Investment Bill. And that gives us the powers as a country to protect ourselves against countries like China who are trying to infiltrate our companies and steal our technology. That's what we need to do. But we also need to stand up for our values. And for example, when it came to Hong Kong, I was pleased to ensure that we put the funding in place to welcome to this country thousands of people who wanted to leave Hong Kong. Rishi, I challenged you on this in the debate last week. As recently as a month ago, you were pushing for closer trade relationships with China. This is not something you've advocated in government. I'm delighted that you've come round to my way of thinking. But it's been driven by the Foreign Office, the toughest stance we've taken on China, whether it's creating the alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road with our G7 colleagues, whether it's being clear that Taiwan should be able to defend itself in the face of Chinese aggression. We have led on that, and frankly, what we've heard from the Treasury is a desire for closer economic relations with China. My view is we should not repeat the mistake we made with Russia of becoming strategically dependent on Russia, and we're now facing the costs of that on energy. But, we but, can't but be Liz, strategically let, dependent let on Rishi China. Let Rishi Sunak answer you, you said not that long ago that we, our relations with China were entering a golden era. Those I think that words. was almost a decade no, ago no, no, I said wasn't. that, It was just it was. a few years ago. You went on a trip there and you wanted to deepen collaboration in areas like food security and technology. Now, look, it's right that as threats change, we all need to evolve policy for that. But, look, I agree with, actually, the head of MI5, who recently addressed this issue and made it plainly clear that, of course, we need to protect our values, stand up for our values, protect our country against threats, but that's not incompatible with engaging with countries around the world when it's in our interest to do so. I need to and bring Faisal Islam that we on can it. Protect ourselves Let me bring Faisal That's on. what the head of MI5 said, and I agree with him. So, obviously, you both know China's going to be or might be the world's biggest uh, economy in the next decade. Are you willing to... You know, the rhetoric is tough, but are you willing to actually damage our trade relations with our number one import partner, our number six export partner, and something tangible? OK, a, a Chinese-owned company owns a big social media company that has connections into millions of teenagers. Are you going to crack down on TikTok, like uh, some of your MPs have uh, said you should? We should. We absolutely should be cracking down on those types of companies. And we should be limiting the amount of technology exports we do to authoritarian regimes. I've been talking to our G7 allies about this. 
we collectively represent 50% of world GDP. I don't think it's inevitable that China will be the biggest economy in the world. In fact, we've been enabling that to happen. But I'm very clear, you know, after the appalling abuses in Xinjiang, after the terrible actions on Hong Kong, and the most recent outrage, which is China working with Russia and essentially backing them in the appalling war in Ukraine, we have to take a tougher stance. We have to learn from the mistakes we made of Europe becoming dependent on Russian oil and gas. We cannot allow that to happen with China. And freedom is a price worth paying. OK, TikTok, are you going to be clamping well, down I, as, on that? As I was saying earlier, I, I helped pass in Parliament a piece of legislation that gives the government the powers to block investment in our economy from countries and companies that we think are not consistent with our values or our interests or are trying to infiltrate our organisations. And that's happening not just in the corporate world, Faisal. It's happening in our universities and civic society, and we need to be on guard against that. And as Prime Minister, I'll take a very, very robust view on making sure that we do stand up for our values and we protect ourselves against those threats, because that's the right thing to do for our security. You've mentioned uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh the war there. I'm interested in how far you would be prepared to go on that issue. There are decisions that you as Prime Minister would have to take and you'd be responsible for making. Would you deploy, for example, the Royal Navy to the Black Sea in order to protect the vital grain uh, supplies that are now coming out of Ukraine? We have, we have led the free world in our response on Russia Ukraine and I'm proud of that because we're not just defending freedom and democracy in Ukraine, we're defending it across Europe and I remember seeing in the 1980s, the, uh, the Iron Curtain being rolled back, people gaining their freedom for the first time, and it is a terrible prospect that that, that is under threat. And so I'm asking about decisions you have, have to have make in the future here. So would you be prepared in this war with Russia and Ukraine, would you be prepared to deploy the Royal Navy to the Black Sea to protect those great I am not supplies prepared. that needed? I am not prepared for the United Kingdom to become directly involved in the conflict. We have done as much as we can. We were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine. Uh, we've put the toughest possible sanctions on Russia. We're actually helping with areas like maritime insurance on helping that get that grain out of Odessa. And an agreement has been reached. But Ukraine is not a NATO country. Okay. And I think it would be wrong to directly deploy our troops and our resources. Rishi Sunak, would you be prepared to deploy the Royal Navy? No, I think actually we should take a step back and recognise that we've put together one of the strongest set of economic sanctions that the world has ever seen, and that's really hampered Putin's war effort. We also, and I did this as Chancellor, made sure that we supported Ukraine financially with the arms and weapons they need to defend themselves. And actually, it's something that Liz and I worked together on. And as, as she said, I think collectively we can all as a country be enormously proud of the contribution and leadership that the United Kingdom has shown in standing up to Russian aggression. And, and that will continue, I would imagine, on whoever becomes Prime Minister. Another big global issue, of course, climate change. We had record temperatures here in the United Kingdom last week. It was more than 40 degrees Celsius for the first time. What three things should people change in their lives to help tackle climate change faster, Rishi Sunak? Right, OK, well, I'll take advice from my two young daughters who are the experts on this in our household. And what they say to me is, I talked about energy efficiency before, but reducing energy usage through things like better energy efficiency is an obvious thing we can do. The benefit of that is it actually saves us money as well, which is fantastic. And that's why I said government should do more on that. The second one is recycling. And that is the thing that in our house we are obsessive about. I know it's a pain, you need lots of bins, but it is something that is very good for the environment. And I think the third thing I would say is we've got to focus on innovation because we're going to solve this problem if we doing the amazing British thing that we always do, our in researchers, inventors, companies, creating the solutions to the problems of the 21st century. And that's what I saw in my business career working around the world. And that's what I think we need to focus on as a country, because that's how we're going to solve this problem and leave our kids a much better environment and climate. Three things from you, Liz Truss. Well, I was a uh, environmentalist before it was fashionable. I was a teenage uh, EK warrior campaigning against uh, damage to the ozone layer. And I've always taken the view that we should save our resources. I'm, a, I'm naturally a thrifty person. I like saving money. And it also helps the environment. So it's about using less, wasting less, particularly food waste, which I think is you know, a massive problem in this country. But also the innovation that we need to get the new technology that can help us do things better, whether that's electric vehicles, whether that's insulation in our homes. We can all act. 
But what I don't want to see is ordinary households penalised by our net zero target. So I would lift the green energy levy and cut money from people's fuel bills whilst looking for better ways to deliver our net zero target. I want to talk now about the tone of this campaign because it has already become very personal, hasn't it? I mean, I am looking at your earrings, Liz Truss. Uh, there's talk of how much they cost in the press today. I don't know if they're the ones you're wearing, but £4.50 was the figure that was being banded around. Your suits and your shoes, which were apparently much more expensive. Chris Mason, I, I never thought we'd be talking about earrings and suits and shoes in a <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if Chris Mason's ever been to Claire's accessories, to be fair. I'm not sure. He has daughters. He might have been, but anyway. On that point, you're right. I, I haven't. <laughs> I, and and it, it feels odd to be venturing into something of a fashion commentary. But yes, there's been this conversation today, hasn't there, involving a Dean Doris the Culture Secretary, one of your supporters, Liz Truss, in which she compared favourably uh, your uh, thriftiness as far as your earrings are concerned uh, with Rishi Sunak's choice of expensive footwear and even more expensive suits. And I just wonder to both of you, given that this is what your supporters are saying and one of Rishi Sunak's supporters replied to this exchange on social media with FFS, which very roughly translates as, <laughs> for goodness sake... Um, <laughs> Is I'm, that, not, I'm not sure. It, yeah. it, is, <laughs> leave it there. It's yeah. like family programme. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but the, the serious point here is, does this matter? Because your campaign teams and those supporting you are suggesting it does. Rishi Sunak, does this matter? Well, look, I, I, you know, I've got enormous respect and admiration for Liz and actually all the other people who spent time in this leadership campaign. And actually, when this is all done, we're it's all part people of the on your side, conservative though, and how family. They're we're going to come together and keep working hard for the British people. But look, I can address this, you know, this issue uh, about me very, very directly, right? I mean, it's very simple. I think in the Conservative Party, we judge people by their character and their actions. I'm proud of my record as Chancellor in helping some of the most vulnerable people over the last couple of years. And I wasn't born this way. Right? My family emigrated here 60 years ago. I told you about my mum. She ran the local chemist in Southampton. That's where I grew up working, in the shop, delivering medicines. I worked as a waiter at the Indian restaurant down the road. And I'm standing here because of the hard work, the sacrifice and love of my parents and the opportunities they provided for me. And that's why I want to be Prime Minister, because I want to ensure that everyone, your children and grandchildren, have the very same opportunities that I had. And actually, those values, those values of hard work and aspiration, those are conservative values, and those are exactly the type of values that I will champion as Prime Minister. Chris? Let's just directly and specifically, will you disown the remarks from Dean Doris today? Well, I have to confess, Chris, that since this campaign started, I've deleted Twitter from my phone. Well, we've just told you so what she I'm said. Not, so I'm not. I am not. Well, look, I don't, I don't have any issue with how expensive anybody else's clothes are. And actually, I think Rishi is a very finely dressed person and I'm a great admirer of his dress sense. So that is not something that I would... And I don't know how she knows where I got my earrings, to be, to be perfectly frank about it. I'm, I'm campaigning in this, in this leadership election in a positive way about the, my experience and what the value that the brings. The point is, a very prominent supporter of yours is making very specific suggestions about the choice of clothing of your rival. And I'm asking you specifically whether you well, disown that. I, I'm not going to give Rishi fashion advice. I mean, I've, I've said he's so a very well-dressed man. I'm not going to give him fashion advice. And I don't think you know, this is really the key issue in the campaign, frankly. You know, we've, we've had a really serious discussion about the importance of growing the economy and what will help achieve that. That's what people in Stoke-on-Trent want to hear about. They don't want to hear about Rishi and my fashion choices. But it's about... Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe the people in the audience do. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's... They're, they're all shaking their heads. They don't, they don't want to hear about this stuff. It is a tone, though, isn't it, of the campaign that, that is being set? I mean, something else that has been talked about a lot, and you've mentioned it again tonight, that you went to a comprehensive school, you have brought out repeatedly that Rishi Sunak went to a private school. Does that matter? Are you trying to say that as a Prime Minister you will be a better Prime Minister because you went to, conservative, to a comprehensive school? I'm just saying that having been to a comprehensive school and seen the way many of my fellow children were let down by the school and by some... There were some brilliant teachers in the school, but there was also some pretty patchy education, and by the lack of opportunities locally and the you know, low expectations of what some children could achieve. That's what motivated me to go into but you politics. Keep comparing well, that's yeah. why I, that's why I want to have yeah, let, let me, you know, because Liz, you have, you have brought that against. up. Well, hang on, Liz, you, you, brought, you brought it up before as well. So let me just address it. Look, my, my parents were part of an immigrant family that came here. 
They didn't start with very much, but they worked day and night, saved and sacrificed to provide a better future for their three children. And I am nothing but enormously grateful mm. for everything that they did for me. And I'm certainly not going to apologize for the fact that they worked hard and they aspire to do that for their kids. And in fact, as I said before, those values, those conservative values about hard work and aspiration and building a better future for your children, that's why I want to be prime minister. That's why I want to do for other people. And that's the values that we should champion in this Let country. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. Let me be clear that Winchester is a very, very good school. And I would love people from right across the country to have the opportunity to go to a school like that. The issue was, when we had the debate last week, is I was being questioned about why I thought what I did in the past. So I was explaining my upbringing, the fact that I was brought up in a, a left-wing household, the fact that I did go to a comprehensive school, and how that shaped my views of where I am today. That was why I was giving that explanation. OK, I want to talk about Boris Johnson. We haven't spoken about Boris Johnson tonight. Rishi Sunak. What do you say to Conservative Party voters who, who perhaps voted Conservative at the last general election because they wanted Boris Johnson as Prime Minister? What do you say to them, people who now see you as the man who brought him down? Yeah, well, it was an easy decision. It was a difficult decision. I've explained my reasons for it at the time. But it was a decision I made on principle. And that's what you should know about me, that I'm always going to act on principle. And actually, several years ago, when I was told that if I supported Brexit, it would be the end of my career. I went on and did it anyway, because I did it out of conviction, because I believed it would be the right thing for this country. And as Prime Minister, that's what I'll do for all of you. I would Personal. always act on principle. I just want to pick that up with, um, with Liz Truss. Um, you're sort of apologetic about the previous support for the Remain campaign. But um, you were central to the most egregious example of what Leave campaigners referred to as Project Fear, that it would cost £4,300 per household. Now, I want to know, I know you think that's probably an error, but do you think that that was a, a forecast mistake or was it sort of knowingly misleading? Or do you think it might be right? Well, that's, that's where I lost, lost trust in Treasury forecasts. And this is the point I'm making. Those forecasts did not come true. Those predictions of doom did not come true. So that's Liz, why I don't believe... You were the believe. one propagating That's them. why I don't... Well, I've learnt from that. <laughs> I've learnt from that. I've been very clear that if there was a referendum again, I would vote to leave. It was the right decision. And since the referendum took place, I've delivered dozens of trade deals. I've pushed through the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill to sort out the issues in Northern Ireland. I've delivered the tough sanctioned regime that we couldn't have delivered if we were part of the U EU. And I'm very, very keen to take advantage of all the opportunities of Brexit. I think more than most of other government ministers, I've done more to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. Chris Mason, we've moved away from Boris Johnson already, but he is still <laughs> looming large in this campaign, isn't he? He is looming large, and he, he's the man whose uh, behaviour and activities in government led to the, the very conversation that we're, we're having now. And I wonder to both of you, as you look back on the... Uh, the guy who was your boss, Rishi Sunak, and let's just who, who, who still is, how, how you weigh things up. So to, to you, Rishi Sunak, you know that lots of Conservative Party members right now are very angry that Boris Johnson has been, has been brought down, and they blame, in part, quite significantly, you for it. And he made you, didn't he? He made you Chancellor of the Exchequer, gave you one of the biggest jobs in government, and you brought him down. Well, I, Chris, as I said... I, he's one of the most remarkable people I've met. I was very grateful to him that he gave me that job, and I'm really proud of all the things we achieved in government together, actually. Get, getting the Brexit gridlock paralysis that we all remember, getting that broken, winning that election victory, helping get the country through COVID, standing up to Ukraine. Those are all things I was proud to serve under his leadership and achieve. But it got to a point where, for me, personally, and these things are personal decisions, and Liz made a different decision to me on this, but that's totally understandable, enough was enough. I thought all the things that were going on on the conduct side were not right, and we clearly had very different views about the direction of travel on the economy. And so for me, I acted out of principle. And I think that's important, and that's what I'll do. And when it comes to you know, this Remain thing and Liz was saying, I do think that we need someone as leader who has the consistency and courage of their convictions. And that, as I've demonstrated, is something I will bring to being prime minister of this country. Chris. And this just on the... Ms. Truss, on the point of loyalty, that, that you've, you've used that word to describe where you, where you stuck with uh, Boris Johnson, and plenty of people will, will admire loyalty, but I just wonder, 
What would Boris Johnson actually have had to do for you to resign? I, I supported Boris for the leadership. I was his first cabinet supporter to come out. I campaigned with him. He did a brilliant job of delivering Brexit. He did a brilliant job of delivering an 80 seat majority, including gaining the support of um, places like Stoke-on-Trent, which you know, hadn't voted Conservative before. Mm. And you know, yes, he made mistakes. And he, he admitted he made mistakes. But I didn't think the mistakes he made were sufficient that the Conservative Party should have rejected him. At, you know, and that's, that is my view. And I'm still working uh, with the Prime Minister. I'm still Foreign Secretary. I think it's important that I remained in my post. We have very, very serious issues to deal with on Russia, Ukraine, and, on the international situation. And, and I thought it would be a dereliction of duty for me to leave my job at that juncture. Hastra Vista, that's what he said when he uh, spoke in the last Prime Minister's questions last week. I'll see you later. Would you be happy to work with him? Would you like to work with him if you are Prime Minister in your new cabinet? Having, having spent time with him this week on foreign affairs, I very, very much suspect that he doesn't, would not want a future role in the government. I think he needs a well-earned break uh, from what has been a very difficult few years. I mean, after all, he was seriously ill with COVID. I mean, we haven't even talked about that. And that was a terrible moment when we didn't know uh, what was going to happen. Uh, he has faced you know, real challenges that no leader would have expected to face you know, the, the appalling war in Ukraine. It's, so I simply don't think that, that that is really an option. Chris, it's, it's not clear really what Boris Johnson is going to do next, is it? It isn't. It often isn't, uh, which is journalistically was uh, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the intriguing things of covering his, his premiership. But I noticed this, just that wasn't quite... That wasn't quite a, a, a no, was it, in terms of potentially involving him in government? Were he, were he to want to? You were assuming he wouldn't, but he, you're trying to... I really, I, really do, I really don't think it's a, it's a genuine question, Chris. It is uh, a well, genuine question. James Cleverley, the Education Secretary, he's saying, you know, he's one of your supporters. He said today that Boris Johnson is an incredibly talented politician. James Cleverley will be comfortable with him joining your top team if you are. are you? I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think that... You know, what's done is done. The party has made the decision. I've told you my views of that. I have now put myself forward as a candidate because I think I'm the right person to do the job. And I don't believe that he would want further Can involvement. I, uh, I, 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 mind you, that I think the answer, simple answer for me is, is no. I think we need to look forward at this point. That's why I want to be Prime Minister. I want to bring the change that this country needs. I think it's incumbent on whoever leads our party going forward to bring everyone back together actually and build a team that draws on all the talents and traditions of our fantastic party. You saw some of that in this leadership election. That would be my priority, is to try and unify things. But we've got to go on and deliver on the things that people care about. Everyone here wants us to go and fix the backlogs, get a grip of illegal migration, deliver the growth by making sure that this economy is fit for I, the 21st I, century. Okay. That's what I want I to get on and start delivering for people a, and not looking back to the past. This is a fundamentally a moot point. And what we are debating about is debating about the future. We should be talking about the policies that are going to deliver for Britain and going to deliver the next election for the Conservatives and how we're going to beat Keir Starmer. And, and as far as you're concerned, Boris Johnson is not part of the future. He's, I'm sure he will have a role, I'm sure he will be vocal, but he will not be part of the government. As a Conservative Cabinet Minister has said today that this contest, he's called it puerile and embarrassing. Is he right? No. I mean, this is a... All, all, all leadership contests, all elections, have elements of debate and discussion. But we are having a really serious discussion about the future of our country and the party. And there is a genuine disagreement here. Whether or not you believe in low taxes, leading to growth and opportunity, enabling people to keep more money in their pockets or, passing or whether, the bill or whether you children believe in the highest taxes and for 70 years and that is a serious issue it's not our, the well. differences between me and rishi are oh. serious differences they're certainly not pure right okay i want to ask our audience uh, what they make of it all tonight we've talked about leadership character trust so let's hear from our audience on these issues julie uh, you work in a pharma in pharmaceuticals what, what do you want to hear from politicians 
Um, it just seems to me as though there's an awful... It's very, very easy. Um, we've heard a lot of blaming Boris about trust issues, as though everything is going to be fine now. Um, but it seems to me that there's a more fundamental issue around a culture in Westminster that is very much focused on, you know, the short-term catnip of a media mm. soundbite rather than actually thinking about, well, OK, what are the difficult things that are needed long-term? Uh, Liz, you work in finance. What, what qualities are you looking for in our next Prime Minister? Um, there's three qualities that I'm looking for. Somebody that I can trust, somebody that's honest, and somebody that's got integrity. And Mel, software engineer with us as well this evening. What, what about you? Do, you? do you feel that the politicians, that these two here, are being honest with you tonight? It's a very difficult question. I feel like uh, over the years, um, the public's trust has depleted. And I feel like the next Prime Minister, whoever it might be, will need to have a high level of integrity and just be open and honest to the mm. public about issues that's happening, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. So you know, I, you know, I, I, you're absolutely right, Mel, and, and Liz said the same thing as the Julie. So one of the, my first jobs is to try and restore trust in government. And as actually, as all of you said, but Mel, you said at the end, that's about being honest. That's how you start restoring trust, about being honest. And as you can see in this election, I have not taken the easy road. Right? In saying the things that I'm saying about the challenges facing our economy and what it's going to require to fix them, you know, that doesn't make my life any easier. I'm doing it because I want to be honest with all of you. I want to be honest with everyone okay, watching. OK, I need to get to live and, trust and that, now. Well, hang on. I, this is really important. But the, the, the next way that we restore trust after being honest is delivering things for you. And whether it's getting the backlogs down, whether it's illegal migration, it's getting on and doing the hard work of government that Julie yep. talked about, actually, in her opening thing. Okay. And it's acknowledging I, I, I... that we can't necessarily have everything. We've got to acknowledge the trade-offs in life. And actually, we've had a lot of trying to have your cake and eat it. I think there's a lot of what we're hearing tonight, which is the same old, let's have our cake no, and eat not. it. Let's, let's Government's trust. not let, about that. You know, let, let's about trust. Trust. I think restoring trust in, in politics is about keeping your promises. And when we were elected in 2019, we promised we wouldn't put up taxes, including national insurance. That's why I spoke out against it in Cabinet. We didn't need to do it. There was money left in the budget not to do it, but those taxes were put up. And I think it's that kind of thing, politicians not following through on their promises, that destroys trust. Okay, now and I'm somebody who always keeps my promises. I'm straightforward, I'm honest, I'm straight talking. I might not be the slickest presenter in the business, but I do what I say I will do. Okay. I've done it in trade, I've done it in the Foreign Office, and I will do it as Prime Minister. You say you're straight talking. I want yes and no answers on this. We have a few quick fire questions. Yes or no, quite simple, because we are running out of time. First of all, those huge queues that we have seen over the weekend in Dover, in Folkestone, is Brexit to blame for those queues? Yes no. or no? No. Categorical. Uh, two more strikes coming this week, two more train strikes. Will you ban strikes on essential public services like the railways? Yes, yes. it's a manifesto commitment yep. and we need to deliver it. We'll do it. Very clear. Will you publish your full tax affairs if you're Prime Minister? Yes. yes. You're making this easy. Uh, as Prime Minister, what marks would you give Boris Johnson out of ten, Ms. Truss? Seven. 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 Rishi Sunak? Uh, you know what, I, my views are clear. When he was great, he was great, and it got to a point where we need to move forward. And what does, what does that mean? Five out, five out of ten? Well, actually, actually, in delivering a solution to Brexit and winning an election, that's a ten out of ten, right? You've got to give the guy credit for that. No-one else could probably have done that. Right? And finally, we have a couple of minutes left. So this last question, I want you to address each other. You've both worked together in government for a long time. You've sat around the Cabinet table. You know each other well. Liz Truss, if you lose this contest and Rishi Sunak becomes the next Prime Minister, what quality does he need to work on in order to be the best possible <laughs> Prime Minister? What quality? Well, Rishi, it's uh, been fantastic working with you. We've always got on well, and I think we've shared a belief in Britain. Uh, I've already said that you're a sharp dresser, uh, so that's, that's not something you need to work on. But the thing I think you should work on, and I want to work on this with you, and if I win, I would love you uh, to be part of my team, uh, is taking more risks and being bolder. Because I think that's what we need to do as a country. OK. And Rishi, we cannot Rishi, just have more business as usual. We're running out of time. Rishi Sunak, what quality would Liz Truss need to work on 
if she were to become Prime Minister. You know, we had this in another debate, and I'm not going to do it again, because I have enormous respect and admiration for Liz, and she deserves huge credit for being a big part of standing up to Russia over the last six months. She's worked with me, with foreign ministers across the world, to ensure we had a very robust response to that. I saw her at her best doing that, and there is far more that unites us than that we disagree on. And as I said, we're all part of the same team, we're the same family, and we're going to come together and work hard for all of you. And would you work together in government? Done. Of course I would. Okay. And so that is it. Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. That brings us to the end of our debate this evening. There is, of course, a very long summer ahead for Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss as they try to convince Conservative Party members across the country to vote for them. We will know who our next Prime Minister will be on Monday, September the 5th. Thank you to our audience here tonight for joining us here in Stoke-on-Trent, you can continue listening to the coverage on Radio 5 Live and you can follow reaction on bbc.co.uk forward slash news. But from all of us here in Stoke-on-Trent, good night. It's a £2 billion business built on fighting the establishment and living by a punk ethos. Behind their meteoric rise, there was a culture crisis brewing. I was in a really bad place. I was in shock. Good Ship Brewdog. Listen on BBC Sounds. I'm Lonesome Buzz, it says the patient breathing. <laughs> I've killed it. Do I know you? Who was it, Gabriel? No idea. Do you remember? Well, she knows you. What's going on? The Control Room. Press red for all episodes on BBC iPlayer. Now BBC One Scotland. Fiona Bruce with the BBC News and Laura Miller with Reporting Scotland. It's 10 o'clock. Tonight at 10, Rishi Sunak and Liz Trust trade verbal blows as they debate head-to-head -head for the first time. Both come out fighting to attack each other's policies, particularly on the economy. Your proposals would mean that we get the short-term sugar rush of unfunded borrowed tax cuts, but that would be followed by the crash of the higher highest... prices and higher mortgage rates. Crashing the economy in order to pay a debt back quicker is a massive mistake. Did either candidate to be our next PM come out on top? We'll be getting reaction from tonight's debate. Also on the programme, the former First Minister of Northern Ireland and Ulster Unionist Party leader Lord Trimble has died aged 77. The Court of Appeal rules doctors can stop providing life support to 12-year-old Archie Battersby, who's in a coma. Pope Francis apologises for decades of abuse of indigenous children at church schools in Canada. And Eurovision's coming to the UK. We will host the contest next year after coming second to Ukraine. And on Reporting Scotland, a damning report finds that Cricket Scotland is institutionally racist. And could Eurovision be coming to a city near you? Glasgow and Aberdeen throw their hats in the ring. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at 10. The two people who want to be our next Prime Minister have debated head to head tonight for the first time. In sometimes fractious exchanges, Rishi Sunak attacked Liz Truss's intention to cut taxes and increase borrowing as unconservative. She in turn said his policies would crash the economy. They were taking part in a televised debate for the BBC from Stoke-on-Trent. Our political correspondent Ben Wright was watching. 
They arrived looking relaxed, but this was their biggest test yet. A chance for Tory party members to judge the credibility and electability of the duo vying for number 10. A chance for the country to hear how they would lead it. In six weeks, either Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak will be Prime Minister. And this debate was the first time they have gone head to head. Some Tory MPs have called for a calmer, less toxic contest. But their first clash was on the economy and tax. The gulf in approach, plain to see. I would act immediately. I understand that people here, people around the country, are struggling with some of the worst cost of living problems that we've had for generations. It's hard to pay for fuel. It's hard to pay for food. I would reverse the increase in national insurance. But Rishi Sunak ripped into his rival's plans for immediate tax cuts. You promised almost £40 billion of unfunded tax cuts, £40 billion more borrowing. That is the, company, the country's credit card. It's our children and grandchildren. Everyone here is that kids. Is, that so is we're going to have true. to pick up the tab for that. Rishi, that and is not nothing true. conservative about doing it. It was hot-tempered and combative as they argued over how best to deal with soaring inflation and the rising cost of living. Hard-working taxpayers who do the right thing have seen their taxes rise despite the fact that we promised in our manifesto so, so, well, well, not so, to so, do hang it. On, Fizer, I uh, think that is what... Fizer, 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 you, just mentioned, you just mentioned three countries. Do you know what mortgage rates are in the US at the moment? Do you want to use them as an example? Their mortgage rates are almost 50% higher than mortgage rates in this country because they're borrowing so much. I'm, I'm you sorry, this Canada. is scaremongering. Ca Canada this actually is has project a... fear. From the former Chancellor, a promise of tax cuts in the future. But on tax cuts, I am going to deliver tax cuts, actually. We're going to deliver tax cuts for business investment because that's how you drive growth and productivity in places like Stoke. That's what the businesses here tell me they want. But we're also going to deliver tax cuts in this parliament for working people. Okay. In the audience, people who voted Conservative at the last election and they wanted the candidates to level with them on what could be done for their community. Town centres are completely empty. There seems to be no investment. We seem to have a rise in antisocial behaviour there. So basically, um, how are they going to level up these sort of areas? What are they going to do for us? Well, I am completely committed to levelling up. It's not just a slogan for me. It is about the, li the life I've had. I've seen you know, what happened in Paisley, what happened in Leeds when children were let down by a combination of low expectations, poor opportunities and poor educational standards. So that's what levelling up should mean. It should mean that no matter where you grow up, you have fantastic opportunities to fulfil your potential, but you also have enormous pride in the place that you call home, and that's what Brendan was talking about, making sure that community that you grow up in is safe for your kids to walk around in in the evenings, okay. making sure that the town centres look exciting and clean. The debate then turned to the UK's relations with the rest of the world and a clash over who would have the toughest approach towards China. Frankly, what we've heard from the Treasury is a desire for closer economic relations with China. My view is we should not repeat the mistake we made with Russia of becoming strategically dependent on Russia, and we're now facing the costs of that on energy. You said not that long ago that we, our relations with China were entering a golden era. Those I were think your that words. was almost a decade no, ago no, no, I said wasn't. that. It was just it a few was. years ago. You went on a trip there and you wanted to deepen collaboration in areas like food decade. security and technology. These are two people with very different backgrounds, and that was thrust to the foreground as the argument turned to character.